we are being refined for God's glory. Nobody enjoys the process of being refined, for it involves heat and fire and change and taking us out of the things that are preventing us from being pure. It begins with recognizing who we are and the things we've been thinking and doing. But God is refining us for his glory, and I will explain. The verses we are about to read were originally addressed to the 6th century BC Jews living in Babylonian exile. And God was refining them, Isaiah 48. Listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. Unfortunately, it was all about appearances for the people. They proclaimed oaths in God's name. They invoked his name, but they were not righteous in doing so. Their actions betrayed their words. They did not honor God in their lives. In Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord declared, and we read this a few weeks ago, this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. In other words, the people liked all the blessings and associations of being God's chosen ones, but it was lip service, and God called them out on it. Reading on. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is his name. They claim to rely on the God of Israel, and they call themselves citizens of the holy city of Zion, of Jerusalem, but it was all lip service for show, as we will soon see. However, God had done a marvelous thing for them. He has set in place for them a freedom, the freedom to return to that holy city, to Jerusalem. I foretold the former things long ago. My mouth announced them, and I made them known. Then suddenly I acted, and they came to pass, for I knew how stubborn you were. We read last Sunday how God had brought in King Cyrus of Persia to overthrow the Babylonian Empire, the rulers of the Jewish people in exile in Babylon. But even that act of God bringing in Cyrus the Great didn't change the hearts of the vast majority of the people into becoming worshipers or servants of him. They were a stubborn bunch, lip service only, and God described how stubborn. Your neck muscles were iron. Your forehead was bronze. Necks constructed of inflexible iron muscles that made it nearly impossible for the head to turn, to listen, or change directions. Foreheads so impenetrable that metaphorically they appeared to be made of bronze. I know people like that. Probably you do too. But God was able to refine some of those people in 6th century BC Babylon to refine some of them, at least, to change them. And he would do so first by telling them about the miraculous freedom that he would be providing through King Cyrus the Great. And it wouldn't be idols, false gods, made of wood or metal who would be freeing them. It would be only God. Therefore, I told you these things long ago. Before they happened, I announced them to you so that you could not say, my images brought them about, my wooden images and metal God ordained them. The people claimed to be God's people, but most of them didn't live that way. They had been born Jewish of the line of Jacob. They were called by the name of Israel. They invoked God's name and they made oaths in God's name as proofs of who they were. But they didn't really believe in God or want to worship him or follow him. They lived as Babylonians. They lived as if the wooden images and the metal gods of Babylon held more appeal to them than did God, Yahweh God, the one true God, our God. As proof of this, consider this fact, that when the opportunity was given to them to return to Jerusalem, the place that they called their city, their holy city, that of the 950,000 Jews living in Babylon, 
900,000 of them didn't move. They didn't budge. When they had the chance to go back to Jerusalem, they stayed in Babylon. They preferred it there. That in itself was a proof in the pudding that all of their invoking of God's name, making oaths in his name, claiming to serve him was all lip service. They didn't go back to Jerusalem. They were more comfortable in Babylon. They preferred the comfort and the ease of the lives that they had come to put together in Babylon. You've heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. They are created now and not long ago. You have not heard of them before today. So you cannot say, yes, I knew of them. You have neither heard nor understood. From of old your ears have not been open. Well, well do I know how treacherous you are. You are called a rebel from birth. Now for the sake of his own name and for his own glory, God had placed his people in the fires of, fires of testing and affliction of Babylonian exile. At first it was really hard for the people. Eventually, as we just heard, they got used to it, became comfortable there. But they had been sent to Babylon because of their sin, and instead of destroying them for their sinfulness, God would, while they were in Babylon, simply turn up the heat on them to refine them. Now, it would be an undeserved mercy, that refiner's fire, but those Jews who agreed to be refined would be later blessed, and they would impact and change the world, as we will see. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Now I read about some women in a Bible study group who came across this theme of God's refining fire. And it kind of puzzled those ladies. And they wondered about what was involved in the process of refining. And so one of them offered to find out about the refining process and to get back to the group at their next Bible study. And so the next week, that lady called up a silversmith. She made an appointment to go to where the silversmith worked and to watch him at his work. Now, she didn't mention anything. She didn't mention anything to him about the reason for her interest in silver. Beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. So she went to his refining work area. And as she watched the silversmith working in the fire, taking out the impurities from the silver, she noticed that he held a piece of silver over the fire and he let it heat up. And he explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest to burn away all the impurities. And the lady asked the silversmith if it was true, because she had heard this in her Bible study, if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. And the man answered yes, but explained that not only did he have to sit there holding the silver, but he also had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. He had to be watching it closely. If the silver was left for even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. And the lady asked, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And the silversmith smiled at her and he answered, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. You see, refining them is what the Lord was doing with his children, the Jews. They called themselves his children, but because of their sin, God was having trouble seeing his image in them. And so he set to work refining them for his glory, so that others would be able to see his image in those people, thus bringing him glory. Now this concept of refiner's fire is throughout the Old Testament, Psalm 12 and 66, Job 28, Jeremiah 6 and 9, Daniel 11, 12, Isaiah 1, and the verse we just read in chapter 48, they all speak of God's refining fire in the Jews. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. 
Later, the next century, the prophet Malachi wrote, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. And also later, the prophet Zechariah said this about God and his refining work. This people I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. The end result of all that refining would be the people reflecting God's image by identifying fully as his people. The Lord is our God, they would come to say after being refined. You see, before that, they said, we are God's people. Slight difference to hearing, but a huge difference in meaning. We are God's people. In other words, God is our servant. Mm -hmm. The Lord is our God. In other words, we are God's servant. It's about who is serving whom. So the Lord encouraged the people to be refined. And in being refined, that would mean leaving Babylon, that sinful place with its idols and temptations, and return to the holy city, Zion, Jerusalem. And there they would reflect his glory and proclaim his greatness. Leave Babylon. Flee from the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth, saying, The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. For those who would obey him and leave that sinful land of Babylon with all of its sin and idol worship and go back to Jerusalem, God would provide. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. For those Jews who would return to Jerusalem in obedience to what God had commanded, he would grant them safety as they traveled back to Jerusalem, a trip of 900 or so miles. He would grant them peace as they arrived in Jerusalem. God would arrange that King Cyrus would have the surrounding nations provide for safe travel, as well as provisions for the trip. And the surrounding nations would pay for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. God would provide for those who were in obedience to him. And through those Jews who would return to Jerusalem, God would impact and change and bless the world. Think about this. For through them, the Messiah and the Savior, Jesus Christ, came. It was in their midst that our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born. God didn't say that Jesus would be born in Babylon, but in Bethlehem, in Judah. The Jews had to return to the land in order for our Messiah to be born. Those Jews, the ones who returned to Jerusalem, would later have the ability, referring to Jesus, to understand Isaiah chapters 40, 49, 50, 52, and 53. A few weeks ago, we had four speakers, Ken Bender, Shannon Robertson, Sarah Guerrero, and Karen Klein, speak brilliantly on these Lenten devotional servant songs, as they are called. And they are songs about the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not going to take the time to read through those today because they were so expertly and efficiently spoken about during the Lenten devotional series. But they tell of God's servant, Jesus Christ, who would not only serve God, but his people. And this Jesus Christ would be the Messiah, the Savior. And this servant would teach his people about God. And ultimately, he would die on behalf of his people, dying as the suffering servant, Isaiah 52 and 53, also referenced in 49 and 50, dying as the Lamb of God slaughtered for the sake of his people, that their sins would be forgiven, so that they could stand in front of God, clean, redeemed, forgiven, accepted. And finally, that servant of God's, God would raise back to life. Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday. Victorious over death. The guarantor of all who would believe in him, that we would one day enjoy that gift of eternal life. Now think about this. The Jews in Judah and Jerusalem would have a chance to understand those verses because Jesus was with them. 
But the Jews who did not return to the land, who were outside of Judah and Jerusalem, when all of that was happening, they weren't there. They wouldn't understand those chapters. And in Acts chapter 8, we see an instance of this. When the Ethiopian eunuch was trying to read Isaiah 52 and 53, he's trying to understand it. He said to Philip, a believer of Jesus, he said to Philip, who are these chapters referring to? And Philip, who was a Jewish descendant of those who had returned to the land, because he knew Jesus, because he was in the land, was with Jesus, was able to explain that those chapters were referring to Jesus. And the Ethiopian eunuch immediately gave his life to Jesus. But what about those Jews who remained in Babylon, those 900,000 Jews who remained there? Because they chose to disobey God and stay where they were comfortable, they missed out on the birth, the death, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus. They missed out on Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because they chose to stay in Babylon, not only did they largely lose their culture and their identity and their religion because they got absorbed by the Babylonians, they lost out, out on their ability to understand those servant song chapters. It's true that initially they were prosperous and happy in Babylon, but that didn't stay. For those not returning to Jerusalem, it was an unwise and disobedient thing to do. For those who stayed behind in Babylon, this would be the result. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Now, we need to recognize that staying in Babylon may have seemed like the smart thing to do. Don't take risks. Stay where you are. Even if it means living in the midst of idol worshipers. It's a word for us today as well. But God had told them to flee from Babylon. From what it signified and the hold that that Babylonian licentiousness and belief in the occult had on them. They were instructed to flee from that land of compromises. And 50,000 of them did, but 900,000 of them didn't. And they disobeyed God, snubbing their noses at him. You need to know that there was no peace for them. They were absorbed into the Babylonian culture, most eventually assimilated and lost their identity as Jews. And only a small community of Jewish people survived the centuries of life in Babylon. Certainly, they did not make any impact worth noting on the rest of the world or human history. That's a blunt and honest and accurate assessment of the Jews who stayed behind in Babylon. By contrast, the 50,000 Jews who returned to the land of Judah and the city of Jerusalem People who never again worshipped idols. You need to understand, once the Jews returned from Babylon to Judah, they never again worshipped idols or false gods. For those people who never to tolerated the worship of false gods once again, they were blessed because of their obedience. And they were blessed by having the Messiah come through them. And they were blessed by having all of their needs provided for Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut, and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who give you, gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion, and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. The Lord would look after them, and the world would be blessed because of them. This whole returning to Jerusalem saga would be cause to celebrate. And in a verse identical to the one we read a few weeks ago, Isaiah 35.10, we read this about those who returned to Jerusalem. Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. So as in the days of Abraham and Sarah, God would demonstrate his greatness 
and his people's sorrow would become joy. He would restore his people, no matter who or what stood in their way. He would do a beautiful thing, a new thing, for those of his people who would pursue righteousness and obey him and, and return to Jerusalem to Zion. The result would be that they would obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and Zion would flee away. And as they entered into their beloved city, those people would have such joy and gladness as spontaneous singing would burst forth from their lips. So do you remember that chorus where this verse is put to music? Well, let's stand and sing it now. It'll be up on the screen. Okay, let's sing it. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come a singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Once more. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come a singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come a singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their hands. So remain standing. Because the next verses that we are going to read were also put to music, and they're well-known verses. So it's my turn. Therefore, my Lord will know my uh, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So let's sing. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness, our God reigns, 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 our God reigns. See, when God does an amazing thing for his people, they sing, they proclaim, they witness to his greatness, to the fact that he brings salvation and that he reigns. Really, this is what God's refining fire does in people. Those who have not been refined do not sing. Those who have been refined sing. Being refined changes people from being lazy and careless and sloppy and self-absorbed in their worship and in their service into truly being God's people, the image of him, his witnesses, individuals who joyfully proclaim his greatness and love, who tell the world of the good news of God. Back in the days before cable or satellite television or the internet, before even radios and newspapers, the only source of news was through a traveler, somebody traveling, coming to visit, or through official messengers being sent from place to place. So each city would have a watchman on a wall looking for that traveler who would bring news. And the watchman on the wall of a great city would watch out for these traveling bearers of the news, either bad or good. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. 
The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all of the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. We live in an age where people still love to hear news, whether it be bad or good, sometimes even fake. But God wants us to share his good news, to be a watchman for him, to proclaim the good news of what he is doing in this world and in people's lives. We are to be his watchmen, watching out for what he's doing and then telling others about it. However, as I mentioned earlier, God knows that people will not be his watchmen. They will not proclaim his good news unless their hearts are for him, refined by him, cleansed of impurities, purified of sins. It is his will that we become pure and that we are refined. And when we are, something even more amazing happens. We reflect the image of God. Now, I have a relative who is determined to figure out what everyone looks like and where everyone came from. And most of the time, Karen and I, we laugh at her determinations. Johnny has his father's nose, and we look and we think, no. Karen has her mother's teeth, and we think, no. When the resemblance is not immediately evident, my relative will carry it to the extreme. Joey has his mother's baby finger. I heard her say that. Carol has her mother's, her father's kneecaps. I heard her say that. These determinations become ridiculous after a while. But here's the truth. All parents love to hear, to be told that their child reflects them, looks like them, reflects their image. And in the New Testament, we read in 2 Corinthians 3.15 that we are, be we are being transformed into God's likeness with ever-increasing glory. And earlier I mentioned that lady from that Bible study group who went to the refiner's fire to observe the silversmith there, taking out the impurities from the silver until the point where the silver was fully pure. And the woman asked, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And the silversmith smiled and answered, Oh, that's easy when I see my image in it. That is the point. God wants to bring us to in our lives where he can see his image in us. But neither a broken, neither self-centered sinful behavior or a spirit that is broken because of sinful behavior, because of our fallen world. Neither of those reflect God's intent for his creation, and neither of those reflect his image, one sinful, one inherent of sin. You see, sin and this fallen world have harmed that image of God in us. It harms us from reflecting his glory. God's reflection is not seen in the sinful actions of people, nor in those who have been broken because of loss or sin or pain. But God is working in each of us to restore us to his likeness, to his image, to transform us into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Now, we can refuse to participate, to go along with God. We can say, I don't like it. I don't want to change my sinful habits. It's too painful. We can refuse to be refined. We can say that that whole refining process is too unpleasant. And so we can hop out of the fire and walk away. But what does, it, what does that achieve? What good does that do for us or the world? Understand this. God wants you and me, us, to be pure. He wants us to be refined. That's his aim. That's his goal. Allow God to refine you. Ask him to refine you. Come to him for refining. Submit to him. Serve him. Honor him. Worship him. Come into his presence with singing and joy and gladness. And be a watchman, spreading the good news about him. Then he will look at you, and he'll smile. And he will say about you, you reflect my glory. I'm happy with you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are thankful that you are our Father. 
Help us, Lord, to reflect your joy, to reflect the gladness we have in you, to reflect your image. With ever-increasing glory, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.